All right, good evening, everyone. So uh, Swami Sarvadevananda wasn't going to be here tonight and made arrangements to have me do the class. And then plans changed, and he is here tonight, but he's not here tonight. <laughs> so this morning, he asked me to go ahead and do the class with you. Um, I don't really know exactly where everybody was, so I'm going to start in the chapter uh, titled uh, With the Devotees in Dakshineshwar. It's chapter 11, page 365, I think. And uh, really, the only reason is I was reading this the other morning, and there were just several things right in a row that I really enjoyed. But as we start to go into the scripture, uh, it's always good to set our mind and to, to remember that even though the mind may think that it has read this before and heard this before, uh, Sri Nishragadatta makes an excellent point that we should never approach the scripture as if we've read it before. Because act in actuality, nothing in the universe is in the same place uh, as it was the last time you may have read this. Nothing about your mind is, th is the same as the last time you read this. And so to really give the opportunity uh, to the divine to teach and to open that's one of the, my favorite things about scripture is that every time you read it, you can learn something radically different and radically new from the last time that you read it. And so just to go to a quiet place in your mind, uh, as we read, there's not a whole lot of reason to cognate much about it. Uh, Swami Prabhudananda uh, in a roundabout way once told me that, that really reading scripture, reading mythology, the way to do it is, is to, to let it run through you and become aware of the residue that it leaves behind when it's finished, that that is the best way to read it and not to get caught up in thinking because what we're trying to accomplish is not the result of thinking. It's not the result of reason or, or philosophy. It's an opening and an awareness and a steadiness that we're trying to hold on to. Because after all, we're searching for what, we are, for what we already have. And we have to just silence ourselves enough to sense that, to know what it is that we're seeking for. So the master uh, has been teaching all day and talking to lots of people and going through lots of singing and, and enjoying the devotion of the devotees. And the scripture picks up, it says here, after his meal, Sri Ramakrishna sat on the couch. He had not yet found time to rest. The devotees began to assemble. One party arrived from Manirampur and another from Bulgaria. And some of the devotees said, oh, we've disturbed your rest. And the master, oh no, what you say only applies to rajasic people. About them, people say, oh, now they will enjoy their sleep. <laughs> so he's saying that those, those who are paying attention to those kinds of things worry about those things. And if we set up an expectation, you know, if, if he had expected to get his nap and it was being disturbed, then there's the unsettled mind around that. But he's saying, you know, for, for someone who's got their mind on the beloved, who's enjoying that inner bliss, doesn't have an expectation, doesn't have a, a predetermined perspective for what's coming, that they accept what is and are fine with what is in a, in a, a great level of contentment. So he's saying that, uh, uh, no, you know, it's not a bother at all. Didn't even think about it, actually. And so the devotees from Manirampur asked the master how to realize God. Okay, now this is one of the reasons I like this reading. Because <laughs> anytime somebody asks Sri Ramakrishna how to realize God, I'm interested in what he has to say. And he says here, it's quite funny because he, he understates it slightly, which is very kind of him. He says, you must practice spiritual discipline a little. <laughs> so... So he says, you have to do something. You have to do something. He says, it will not do simply to say that milk contains butter. You must let the butter set into curd and then churn it. Only then can you get butter from it. Spiritual aspirants must go into solitude now and then. 
So what are you saying here? It's, it's really a big clue for us on how to, to prepare ourselves to go forward. By letting milk set into curd, it, it becomes solidified to a certain extent. It becomes stabilized. And so he's saying that you have to get your mind to a certain level of stability before you can actually move forward in spiritual life. You have to build an inner sense of integrity. You have to come at least somewhat toward the area where you have an, enough self-control that your yes is yes and your no is no. You've got your, you've got your life under control a little bit, you know, that, that you're not blown left and right by the news and parties and what's going on, but that you can actually, you can actually sit down and silence the mind to some degree for a while. Because these, these teachings and these lessons, while we use the mind to understand them, and we use the mind, oh, in different ways, none of which are really true, <laughs> actually. But we think they are, and so we kind of have to use the mind. It's that one thorn that we're using to get the other thorn out. But ultimately, they both go away. Uh, you know, the, 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 the realized mind is silent. It's not making a lot of noise. It's not uh, churning up the senses constantly. It's not being affected by what's coming in through the radio channels, the five radio channels of experience. But it has its, it has its attention, its, its uh, intuitive attention resting in that stillness within, in that quiet place. And so he's saying that the spiritual aspirants, to do their spiritual practice, you first have to go away to a silent place, get yourself away from the world that affects you, the world that has made you define yourself as you are, the world that makes you think you're a man or a woman, that you're of a certain age, that you're of a certain wealth, that you have certain things to do. And we have to protect ourselves from that constant interpretation of being the body-mind in order to be able to back out of it and come to a deeper understanding of the nature that lies before mind, of the nature that lies before thinking. So he says, spiritual aspirants must go into solitude now and then. After acquiring love of God in solitude, they may live in the world. If one is wearing a pair of shoes, one can easily walk over the thorns. So this steadiness of remembrance this steadiness of the idea of the divine, of the presence of God, that if we can become established at any level in that, that we can walk down the street and our attention won't be going that direction into the change. It will be established in the unchanging and perceive the change. But the establishment and the attention is within that part of you that doesn't change, that has never changed, that part of you that's only intuitive because it can't be objectified. You can't put it in front of the senses to explore. You can't put it in front of the mind to think about, that it is that which is before the mind, before the senses. And so it's an intuitive place of being that only after a bit of practice will you actually have that sensation. And he talks about that here. He says, the most important thing is faith. As is a man's meditation, so is his feeling of love. As is a man's feeling of love, so is his gain. And faith is the root of all. So faith is one of those things that, that I always find myself asking, what is it <laughs> exactly? Uh, you know, I, I grew up thinking that faith was believing something that, that uh, didn't have to be proven. <laughs> you know, someone says God exists, you have faith that God exists. And it was kind of an odd idea of faith because it, it sort of was the idea that religion is supposed to be about truth. And if truth, if I just have to believe it because it can't be proved, well, that's, that's somewhat problematic. <laughs> you know, that's not going to do any good. Uh, Vimalananda, he was a disciple of Swami Vivekananda, and he writes this about faith. And I've, I've used this quite often in some of my lectures because it's beautiful. He says, faith does not mean a sudden effervescence of sentimentalism. So it's not just a feeling of, of love for no reason. It's not, it's not an emotional response to something or a dazzling display of intellectual feet. So it's also not a big thought castle of philosophy that you've built, that you rely on, that you lean on 
for your thinking. He says, faith has no concern with these passing shadows. So faith is not going to be something that is leaning on the changing world, on this material world, and on the thoughts and thinking of the mind. Faith is not going to be born from that place. He says, faith has no concern with these passing shadows. Why? They vanish away before the tremendous facts of life. So he's talking about a deeper truth that is obvious, but not initially apparent to us. He says, so they vanish away at the tremendous facts of life. It stands unmoved in the innermost depth of the heart. So this is that established place deep within the shrine of your own self. It stands unmoved, unchanging, not flickering because it's not based on the things in front of the eyes. It's based on that which is in the innermost depth of the heart. And the one vital principle of all thought and action. So it is, it's, it, this faith is the source. It's the root, like Ramakrishna just finished saying. It's the source of our experience of the moment. It's our source for this establishment within. And here he gets into telling about what it is. So he says uh, that it's in the innermost depth of the heart, the one vital principle of all thought and action in the midst of the varying destinies of earthly existence. It is the intuitive perception of an eternal relation with something which, by its overwhelming prominence, throws into shade the ever vanishing shows of the world and draws us away from it, from its diversified occupations to a close touch with that permanent reality. So it's being aware of this inner world that's unchanging, that is not affected by the constant change of the senses and of the mind. It's an, an eternal relation. It's that paying attention within, you know, it's that knowing uh, the voice of God, the feeling of love. It's, it's the knowing and, and observing things like, uh, well, the, the first two I always bring up in class are the two notions, can anybody name them? The two things that, two concepts that we have that we could not have learned from this world. Eternity or infinity and, et and eternity, right? Well, eternity, okay. Uh, it's, it's um, <laughs> actually, I'm totally spacing on it for a second. It's, it's that, that notion of immortality. Yeah, that notion of immortality. If the mind gets everything from the front, what taught it about immortality? Where did the concept even come from? because there is nothing to point at in the material world that could have given us the concept of immortality. And then the concept of infinity. We know nothing that's infinite. Everything is finite. Everything has a limit. And so it's... And nothing is also eternal. That's right, yes. Eternity, yeah, Vivekananda says about that, he says eternity, and actually Eckhart Tolle also says it, he says eternity is not a long time. <laughs> He says, eternity is no time. It's being outside of time. Because time belongs to mind. Time, space, and causation are all in the tool of the mind, right? And so all of this is pointing toward stepping out of the tool, stepping out of the mind. Because for the mind to conceive anything, it needs three pieces. Do you remember what those are? They're the subject, the object, and the relationship between the two. If you don't have those three pieces, the mind cannot conceive of it. It cannot process it. Because the mind's only duty is to see difference and categorize. Those are the two things that the mind does all the time. It's always looking for difference, how to distinguish something from something else, and then builds the relationships between that and everything else that it's stored away within itself. So in order to do that, it has to have time, right? It has to have a linear way to work with it. Causation, what causes what, why is what in what order, or where are things in their proper place? And that, that space, that allowance for things to be. Uh, Eckhart Tolle has a wonderful chapter on this notion of uh, silence and space. 
he encourages us to be, to be as aware of the silence between words as we are of the words, and to be as aware of the space between objects as we are of the objects. And you say, well, that's a weird thing. Why would I do, <laughs> why would I do that? He says it's very, it's, it's very, very helpful in building faith because if you think about the emptiness of space, that is what allows the manifestation of planets that's, and the placement of things you know, within that space. So it's not, it is empty, but it's not purposeless. It's not, it doesn't have no, it's not no existence. It's just a certain kind of emptiness which allows for manifestation. And silence is that stillness that allows for word, allows for music, allows for vibration, that without that background. And he says, he makes this interesting point, there's no really, no legal way to say it because it represents, it represents the unmanifest, unchanging absolute, silence and space are the symbols within Maya, within this changing world, within this material world, are the, the symbols of that unchanging absolute of God. And if you can become aware of that, that is the presence. Within that is the presence of the divine. And to come to an awareness that you're surrounded by that, and at the same time, it, it is what allows you to exist, what allows you to move and to think and to explore but all within that hand of God. So it's an intuitive perception of an eternal relation, a relationship initially between the small self and this strange world that we live in, the self and the other. And that grows into a relationship between the self and the idea of God or the idea of this higher ideal. And then that moves into personal relation. And then it, it, it gets more and more and more and more subtle as we go along. It becomes an inner relation between our higher self and our lower self. But it's this constant attempt to evolve, this constant need of all things to progress, to, to, to approach their uh, higher ideal, a perfection, which is also a, a third thing that we that we deal with all the time that we can't find in this world and that's this idea of a perfection of an ideal we've never seen anything perfect and yet somehow we're always trying to be perfect always trying to reach this highest ideal so it's that relationship between ourself and that which inspires us to that that which is lifting us or moving us in this direction so faith is that intuitive perception of an eternal relation with something which by its overwhelming prominence, meaning it's all around you, it's like a fish realizing there's such a thing as water, you know? Because why would a fish notice water? It wouldn't, right? Because <laughs> it's everywhere, he can't see not water. And so it's just not part of his consciousness. But imagine becoming aware of water as a fish, I mean, that's the great joy, that's how Takura always talks about the, sw the fish swimming in the sea of bliss. Just that great joy, hey, <laughs> that which keeps me alive and sustains me is literally touching every aspect of myself. And that knowing is the knowing of God, the knowing of that divinity, you know, that, that, that complete absorption in love, in intelligence, and just the practice of being because the practice of being is before mind. You see, if you're thinking of something, it's only a memory. Everything in your mind, uh, even if it's talking in the here and now, is, is from the past. Because your mind, just to get a concept and then throw it back to you, that's time. So it's never present. The mind can never be present. It deals only in memory, only in past and projections for a future. But it, the thinking process itself is behind time, so it's in the past. So this, this sense of being, this practice of the present, it can't be something achieved through mind. It's not holding a thought. It's holding a space, as it were. It's, it's, it's the negation of everything else. And simply 
the awareness by opening all the windows of the senses, opening all the, I the ideas of the mind, but becoming disinterested so that nothing is particularized, nothing is owned. Uh, me and mine is not applied to anything. The breathing that you're listening to, the thoughts going across the mind, the experiences coming in through the senses, you're aware of all of them, but owning none of them, paying attention to none of it, so that you can see all of it equally, that equanimity is only possible with that dispassion or that disinterest, that separation. So this overwhelming prominence, which throws into shade the ever-vanishing shows of the world, you become acutely aware of how nothing can be what it seems. You know, that, that but what I like to remind myself is that everything, right, is what? Potting soil, right? Everything in this world, in its ultimate shape, is potting soil. That Mercedes, leave it there long enough, it's going to become a bucket of potting soil. Your favorite lover, your favorite friend, <laughs> they're, they're going to become a bucket of potting soil. So this world has nothing to offer you but potting soil. And so it's living in this awareness uh, and, and knowing that all of this is not as it seems, but that there is a thread of unchanging that is that Mercedes as it goes through all of the stages of composition and then decomposition, that there's an isness to it. And that isness is the silence and the space. That isness is the divinity in all things. So it's when this, when this overwhelming prom prominence of the surrounding nature of God, the infinite nature of the beloved, uh, throws into shade these ever-vanishing shows of the world and draws us away from its diversified occupations, pulls our attention out of the interest in all the colors and the flash and the fun and the boo 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 boom whatever, all of the different things that change brings about. It breaks the hypnotization so that you stop being pulled after one desire after another, one longing after another, to find one dead end after another, one unfulfilling thing after another. So it draws us away from this diversified occupation to a close touch with that permanent reality, that unchanging reality within. And so that is the faith that Ramakrishna is talking about here. He says the most important thing is faith, to be established in the knowledge that there is a part of you that is not the body and is not the mind. And in the silence of mind, you can see that and you can understand that. You begin to know the mind is always talking to me. If it's talking to me, it must not be me. It wouldn't need to tell me anything if it was me. I wouldn't have to watch a thought if it was me. And the body wouldn't have to tell me it was hungry, wouldn't have to tell me it was tired if it was me. So everything out here is always reporting to me. And that's our big clue. And that's the beginning of faith. When you start to realize there's something here that can't be reasoned about, <clears throat> because it doesn't have those three components to fit in the mind. It can't be absorbed through the senses because it will never be the subject. It is the thing itself. And so it can't, it's like, it's like your face, you know, so you can't get there. And he says that as is a man's meditation, as is a man's stillness, as is a man's quietness or a woman's quietness, a person's uh, established equanimity inside, so is your feeling of love. Why? Because love is that ananda, it's your nature. And in that stillness, that is what you become aware of. That is what comes to the forefront. It's that unchanging, steady hum, white noise of love, of intelligence, of being. And because it's so steady and so unchanging, it's very difficult to find because it has no means of getting your attention because it can't be in front of you. It's unchanging. It's everywhere present and always perfect. So how do you see it? How do you find it if it, if, it, if it can't grab your attention? So it's through that negation. You withdraw into it, and in that intuitive silence of the inner self, you become aware of it. It gurgles up around you, as it were. 
And as long as that idea of me and mine can be avoided, it continues and increases in its volume and in its presence and in your awareness also. And he says, as is your awareness or this feeling of this love, this inner bliss of your own self, so is your gain. That's how you measure how you're moving forward in spiritual life. Vivekananda says there's two questions to ask yourself. Does anybody know what they are? What are the two questions that you ask yourself if you want to know how spiritual you are? Two questions. One, am I unselfish? All right. Am I unselfish? Because your nature is not to be selfish. Your nature is to manifest. And manifesting is always giving. So that's the first question. And the second one is very much like it. Unselfish means it's a negation. Am I not, you know, I'm not taking from everything. But then the second question is, am I loving? Do I have a proactive expression of caring, of love, of unselfishness? So those are the only two questions that you ask yourself if you want to know if you're spiritual or not. It has nothing to do with how many classes you, we come to or <laughs> how many scriptures we've memorized. You know, none of those things are of much benefit. How loving are you and how unselfish are you? So as is a man's feeling of love, so is his gain. And faith is the root of it all. That knowledge, that's something that you're accepting pre-mind because it can't fit. There's no subject-object relation. So it can't be conceived of. And yet you have to let go of everything to experience it. And in order to do that, you have to let go. You know, I remember <laughs> back in the 90s, a long time ago, I went uh, blackwater rafting in New Zealand. And that was rafting an underground river. And it was pitch black down there. And at one point, we'd been going along. We had big inner, big inner tubes that we were riding along on with these helmets with little 40-watt bulbs. And uh, you know, there were rapids. There was a big, I don't know how big the lake was, but my, my lamp couldn't see anything. It couldn't reflect off of anything. So it was pretty big. And we got to the end of that, and there was the sound of falling water. And the, the guides got us up, stood us in a line, and one by one we had to go stand on this lip where the water was going over a waterfall. And we had to turn, over, turn our back to the waterfall, and we had to bend over, and they helped us scooch the inner tube up over our back end. And then they would both take a shoulder and just launch you backwards off of the top of this waterfall into the black, into the, <laughs> into the black. And you fell and then all ultimately landed in this big uh, uh, pond down there. But I tell you, I learned what faith was about, <laughs> you know, to be underground standing at the top of a waterfall and letting somebody launch you backwards into complete blackness, not having any idea what's coming. Th that's rather, uh, it was a big test anyway. I made, I made it, <laughs> but I can see that this is what Ramakrishna is talking about here. He's saying when we're going into this experience of self, you know, when we're negating all the things of the material world that we're so familiar with, that we've defined ourselves by, the comforts of mind, you know, mind uh, is, is always telling us that it knows, but it doesn't know anything. And, and, the, and that's not just a statement. I mean, sit with a with the toddler for half an hour, and by the time they've asked you why for the fourth time, you've come to the end of your knowledge. You don't know the answer to that fourth why, you know. So all of our knowledge and security in this world is no deeper than three whys from a toddler, and we should always know that. And we should always reject the mind as being a comfortable place to be. It's delusive and constantly changing and will always change its story to keep you at the center and to keep the entire universe about you. <laughs> that's its job. And that's what happens when your infinite self meets the particular and identifies with it. The whole universe spins around this. And that causes terrible selfishness and causes terrible lack of love. If one has faith, one has nothing to fear. A devotee, sir, is it necessary to have a guru? Master, yes, many need a guru, 
but a man must have faith in the guru's words. So yes, many need a guru. What's he referring to there, really? Pretty much everybody in our condition needs a guru, you know, a teacher. And it's not so much what the teacher is saying that's important. He says here, he says, a man must have faith in the guru's words. He succeeds in spiritual life by looking on his guru as God himself. Therefore, the Vaishnavas speak of Guru, Krishna, and Vaishnava. So this notion that, and this is a hard one to accept, especially, especially for Americans, this idea of trusting in a guru as God himself. And Ramakrishna says that even if your guru visits a grog shop, you know, even if your guru hangs out at the bar or is a disreputed person, that doesn't matter. That's not the point. It's your willingness to look beyond your guru at reaching the divine, trusting the guru to get you there in the presence of the divine, and going forward in that, in that open act of faith. And the idea is that, yes, your guru may be completely inadequate, but the faith that you're building and the trust that you're building and the, 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 the effort that you're putting forward is your call to God, your call to the universe for that knowledge. And the universe will then bring you, you know, proper teachers. And the, the life of Ramakrishna is really a demonstration of that. For each of the different sadhanas that he went through in his life, a different teacher just showed up out of nowhere. These realized souls were somehow attracted, you know, came, gave him his lessons, and when he learned the lessons from them, they disappeared just as mysteriously as they arrived. You know, we don't know what happened to a lot of these gurus that he talked to. So he says, yes, have a guru and have faith that, that, and look on him as God, as God himself. And so be, be trusting of that and go forward. One should constantly repeat the name of God. The name of God is highly effective in the Kali Yuga. Some people say that we're in, in the Kali Yuga. Some people say that with, with the advent of Holy Mother and Ramakrishna that the Kali Yuga came to a close and now we're in the, what, Satya, Sat, Satva, Sat, the Sat Yuga? Sat. Sat. That yuga of peace, that time of peace, which lasts, I don't know, a long time, <laughs> maybe millions of years. But this notion that, that, uh, that always remembering the name of God, always remembering the presence of God, you know, that's one of the things we're studying on our, in our Thursday night class with the Brother Lawrence and the practice of the presence. It's never forgetting the presence of God under any circumstance for even two seconds, you know, but to always hold that space within. So repeating the name of God, you should repeat it all the time. It's very effective in this, time, this day and age. The practice of yoga is not possible in this age. The practice of that, that uh, you know, bringing up the energy and, and uh, through all of the channels and the self-discipline that it takes. Because in this time, what he says, he says everything here uh, is, about our, is about the stomach. We just don't have the time. We don't have a society that supports that. We don't have, uh, you know, no one just, it's just not the time for that, he says. That the, path, the, the fastest and most effective path to God in this time is devotion, is love, the practice of love for its own sake. He says, the practice of yoga is not possible in this age, for the life of a man depends on food. Clap your hands while repeating God's name, and the birds of your sin will fly away. Yeah, so keep the mind on love for its own sake. Keep your mind on God, that, that highest ideal that you can imagine, that you can know of. Keep your mind centered on that ideal, and there won't be room for all of the other things to come slipping in. You know, the, you will not feel that lack that, that leads you into desire. You won't, feed, you won't feel or be aware of that insecurity of ego that constantly makes you grasp and hold on to things in this world, the material world, to get your strength. Mm -hmm. You know, that need for partners, that need for good jobs, that need for lots of money, that need for prestige and fame and whatnot. That those are the things that are born of ego, that small self identifying with something that has no existence. And because it has no existence, the ego is eternally secure. 
Ramakrishna says that he went looking for his ego and he says, I tell you the truth, I couldn't find it. He said it was like peeling the layers off of an onion. I just kept going deeper and deeper and suddenly there was just nothing there. And so this sense of I, this small sense of I, is, is a, com a completely faulty assumption of our, on our part and one that we cover up and don't let ourselves think about because the most terrifying thing for someone whose fundamental nature is existence is non-existence. And if you're identified with body and mind, to think of them being non-existent is to assume that you will be non-existent, and that's terrifying. So at the bottom of our existence here in this world, in this body, is fear. You know, Ram Vivekananda says, as soon as we had a sense that there was other, fear was born. And you see that uh, also in Genesis, uh, when Adam and Eve take that bite of that fateful fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, the first thing that happened is that they heard God walking in the cool of the day, and they ran and hid in fear. That's the first thing about having an ego that we encountered. And it's a primal, very deep uh, fear. So the practice of yoga is not possible, for the life of a man depends on food. Clap your hands while repeating God's name and the birds of your sin will fly away. One should always seek the company of holy people. The nearer you approach the Ganges, the cooler the breeze you will feel. Again, the nearer you go to a fire, the hotter the air will feel. So as you move yourself toward this ideal, as you establish yourself by the inner fire, you know, by that, by what I, I what I call Nachiketas' fire, you know, that, that this, this shrine within you where your life force is burning, keeping your body at 98.6 all the time, burning up all of your food and turning it into to the body and turning it into thought and mind, that that shrine is where you worship. That shrine is where you take all the stuff coming in through the senses and offer it to the beloved. And your resulting life is your prayer. It's your expression to God. All of your every action that you do is a prayer to God. I want, I need, I have, I want, I, I know, I don't know. So your whole life is a prayer based on what's coming in through your senses and what you do with it and what you put out there. And so he's saying, you know, stay around people who are like-minded, who, who aren't going to, to take you off the path into the things that you don't want to do. You know, I, I uh, several friends that go to AA tell me this is one of their primary teachings. You have to get yourself out of the circles that have encouraged you to fall in the direction you've been falling. You have to find people that are supportive and people who will build up this nature, this unselfish nature within you. You don't want people that are going to make you feel like you need to be selfish to survive. <laughs> so always, he says, always seek the company of holy people. The nearer that you approach the Ganges, the cooler the breeze. You see the feeling in that. The closer to the divine you get, the more fulfilled your life is going to become. The more beautiful it's going to become. The more profound it's going to become. The nearer you get to a fire, the hotter the air will feel. But one cannot achieve anything through laziness and procrastination. <laughs> I would rather skip that that line, but <laughs> laziness and procrastination. So we have to be careful to be up and doing. You know, the mother says one should always be working. You should never lie idly. Uh, the Christians have a saying. It's not actually in the Bible, but it's uh, one of their folk sayings. You know, the, the an idle mind is the devil's playground. You know, because that's when your mind starts kind of wandering around and thinking irresponsibly about things and desires form from the memories that come up, desires form from the experiences that come up, and you get, you get stuck. You start getting pulled into mind, and mind will take you to a particular state of being that will cause you to want uh, habitually return to what you've always thought yourself to be, habitually return you to delusion. But one cannot achieve anything through laziness and procrastination. People who desire worldly enjoyment say about spiritual progress, well, it'll happen in time. We shall realize God at some time or another. 
you know so that casual approach to God like he's an he's a part of your life you know that he's an interest he's a hobby <laughs> she's a hobby you know we we have to break out of that because this isn't about something outside of yourself this isn't about an interesting third party deity that I'm going to go chase this is about you knowing what you are and who you are and discovering firsthand that that is everything, that you are everything that you see here and that that is the nature of this world, that this world is of spirit and this world is of manifestation of, of, of divinity and that the cause underneath every action is love framed in intelligence and manifested in the moment as being, which is as elusive as it can be when you try and find it, when you try and touch something external, you come to realize it's not there, right? You come to realize it's not there. I said to Keshab Sen, when a father sees that his son has become restless for his inheritance, he gives him his share of the property even three years before the legal time. A mother keeps on cooking while the baby is in bed sucking on its toy. But when it throws the toy away and cries for her, she puts down the rice pot and takes the baby in her arms and nurses it. I said all of this to Keshab. So this notion that it's always a checking of the heart, always trying to keep the heart in the proper space, the proper alignment. Not, don't find your contentment in the comfort of the familiar. Always keep pushing to go deeper. You know, there's that story about the sadhu, uh, the, the young brahmachari who meets the sadhu on the road, and the sadhu just tells him, go forward, right? And he goes in and he finds that sandalwood forest, and he bundles, chops it down and bundles it up and makes some good money on it, and then he thinks to himself, well, but wait, he didn't tell me to stop here, he told me to go forward, and so, of course, he goes forward and he finds, what, a, a gold mine, I thought, a silver mine, probably, and then a gold mine, and then some gems, and then a diamond mine, and by the end, he's super, super, super rich, and he's still going forward. And so this is that notion in spiritual life. Don't stop at the place of comfort. Always keep going. Always go forward. Don't be lazy. Don't procrastinate. Don't put it off. Don't take it lightly. Always keep this at the center of your day. Your day is not about God. Your day is God, you know. And it doesn't exist until the moment brings it to you. So you be ready for it by being established in this unchanging notion of self. And as the day passes you one moment at a time, you do each thing encased in this love of being, encased in the, in the intelligence of your existence. You do it with that constant repetition of the name of God so that 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 scent that's coming off the fire of your existence, that, that Nachiketis' fire that burns within you, is always asking for the beloved, always inviting love, always inviting intelligence into itself to manifest and be expressed in this world at large. It is said that in the Kali Yuga, if a man can weep for God one day and one night, he sees him. <laughs> There's your fastest way. That's one day and one night. So in 24 hours, <laughs> if we haven't done it, <laughs> chances are we're being restless or we're being lazy and procrastinating. <laughs> so he says, if you can weep for God for one day and one night, you will see him. Feel peaked at God. You know, get annoyed that you haven't realized God. Get annoyed that he hasn't shown himself or herself to you, hasn't manifested to you. Feel peaked. You've created me. Now you've got to reveal yourself to me. Whether you live in the world or elsewhere, always fix your mind on God. You know, and there, there's a trick to doing that. Keep God a part of your mental conversation always. You know, always ask God, you see something beautiful, tell the mother, Ma, wow, that's amazing. You look beautiful that way, you know. 
Always compliment, see a flower. Oh, you did so nicely on that. Look at how delicate, how small that is. I would have thought you'd had bigger fingers than that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so be constantly in conversation with the presence, with this, with, with the higher self. You know, if, if you're, if you're a Gyani or if you're a Vedantist, it's always the higher self. It's that inner self. It's your ideal that's manifesting that, that, that you've called God. You know, if it's, if it's, if it's God as an external, that's real, you know, at, at a particular place in our progression, those things are all real. Why are they real? Because the way I like to think about it is that you are that, right? That's the ultimate truth. And so if you are the God of all existence, of all things, and you believe yourself to be this, a body mind, this small thing, the entire universe has to suddenly panic, pull itself together so that that is true. So that you are this. And so that's the delusion. That's what makes us think we're sitting in a, in a, in a building in, a, in these pews and, you know, studying scriptures and that we're going to reach some higher state at some imagined future date. That's all part of the illusion that the universe has had to contort itself into in order to, so that that, which you are, can be a body-mind. <laughs> and so we're trying to let go of that notion so that the body can, de the whole universe can decontort and manifest as it is, you know, to be what it is, that we'll see it in that kind of reality. So he says that, that if you have this kind of longing that if you have this kind of insistence, which will grow because mother is so kind in the sense that she'll give you a taste here and there. She'll give you something in the meditation that will make you say, whoa, whoa, what was that? Unfortunately, as soon as you ask that question, it's gone. <laughs> as, soon as, you, as soon as you take ownership of the experience, it goes, boom. And the funny thing is that next time you sit down in meditation, you're like, oh, you're trying to, you're trying to find that space again. But that space existed because you had let go of everything. If you go looking for something, you will never find it in spiritual life. It's always an opening. It's always an undoing. It's always a dusting off. It's never a building. Why? Because anything composed must decompose. So we're looking for that space, that silence between the words, that space between objects to find our freedom to put our attention on that unchanging presence. I said to Keshep about the boy looking for his inheritance, that God, that the man will give it to him early because of his insistence. And the mother, you know, when you cry out to her, when you stop being, uh, you know, content to earn your money and to pretend that everything is fine and going on, that you're going to live forever and never have to face the end of things, then God lets you do that. Sure, go ahead, have fun, enjoy. But when you set it down and be like, ah, I'm going crazy down here. I can't take it anymore. So he says, yes, feel peaked at God. Say you've created me. You must now reveal yourself to me. Whether you live in the world or elsewhere, always fix your mind on God. The mind soaked in worldliness may be compared to a wet matchstick. You won't get a spark. So he's telling you, if you, if you are, you know, always looking for the material satisfaction in life, looking to build some sort of happiness in this world, he says, your meditation's always going to be a, a matter of when will, when, when can I get up? <laughs> oh my God, only 10 more minutes. It will always be dull. It will always be lifeless because the mind will be circling, you'll be lost in mind, still completely missing the pre-mind space of self, the space beyond thought, the space where there is no thought, where there is no ideation, there is no me and mine, there is no subject-object, that space that's just still and silent, but pregnant with what? Satchit Ananda, with your love, with your intelligence, with this isness, this presence. You won't get a spark, however much you may rub it. So meditate as much as you want. If you're still entertaining things of the world in your life, if, if your prayers of your actions 
are still give, give me something, give me something, your meditation will, will, will sit in that state. It'll be arrested, arrested development, as it were. Ekalavya placed the clay image of Drona, his teacher, in front of him and thus learned archery. Okay, so go forward. The woodcutter following the instructions of the holy man. Oh, here's the story. Go forward. The woodcutter following the instructions of the holy man went forward and found in the forest sandalwood. Then he found mines of silver and a mine of gold. And going still farther, he found diamonds and other precious stones. The ignorant are like people living in a house with clay walls. There is very little light inside, and they cannot see outside at all. That's what it is to live in the mind. You're living in a, in a very small world encapsulated by five senses that you cannot see beyond. You cannot see the outside world. You cannot see the reality, right? And of course, I always go to the same places, but they're the things that really teach this kind of truth. The fact that this world that you live in, that you think, all these things that you think are outside, you, have, you can't verify them. You don't know the source of them. You don't know where that, that information's coming from, you know? And do I dare say that again, my whole illusion about light? <laughs> you know, that you, you, you have never seen light. You know, your brain is in, is in a black box, it's in a cranium. There's never been, unless you've been on the, <laughs> had brain surgery, there's never been any light in there. The light that comes into your eyes doesn't even make it past the socket. It turns into, before it's turned into neurochemical signals. And so your brain gets those signals and it has created this, a symbol for light. You don't, we don't know what that actually is. We don't know what it actually looks like. We will never see it. So that's the clay house we live in, this body, this mind. We can't see the outside world. We don't know our condition. We don't know where we are. We can never know where we are. You know, that's one of the things, I only thought about that one recently, which, which just shows I'm not that smart. But the fact that, you know, we'll say, oh, I'm, I'm right now, I'm in Los Angeles. But if somebody else is somewhere else in the universe and you had to get them to here, <coughs> you couldn't. You couldn't get them here because we're not in one place for, for a split second. We're on a planet spinning around itself and then that self is spinning around a sun, and that sun is spinning around a black hole in the center of the galaxy, and that galaxy itself is shooting off into nowhere at ungodly speeds. We never know where we are. And yet we sit so contented in our clay house, completely unaware of all of this, of our nature. We've created that sense of comfort. We've got four black walls around us that we can reach out and touch, but we're falling. <laughs> there's nothing below, but we're like, oh, there's the wall. Okay, you got four walls. <laughs> I'm safe. But you're falling in a perpetual movement. And that's the condition of life. And so he's saying here, you know, wake up. Stop being content with this, with this untrue delusion that you live in. This small world of five senses that have created a universe of touch, taste, smell, and hear. You know? Let go of that, and you will find what Eckhart, or Sri Nishikata, well, they all say it, that you become aware of an immense amount of wisdom beyond thought that happens in silence, a profound awareness that happens in stillness within, that the world beyond senses is infinitely larger than the universe we've created through the senses. So go forward. Don't be the ignorant living in a house with clay walls. But those who enter the world after attaining the knowledge of God are like people living in a house made of glass. For them, both inside and outside are light. They can see things outside as well as inside. So that's just that all seeing. Those, if you've ever met one of these holy men, that gaze when they look at you, when, when, when a normal person looks at you, it's, they stop at your eyes. They stop at your personality. They recognize you as a man or a woman and of this age and of this accomplishment. But when one of these holy people look at you, 
you feel them go into your space. You feel them look through you as a piece of glass. And they know you perfectly as a piece of, through that piece of glass. Why? Because they know the nature of the light that's before your mind, before your personality, before your mind, before your body. And they've seen what's happened to that light as they look at the body and they look at the character and the personality. They know exactly what has happened to that light in order to produce this deluded self that you're presenting. And you feel that. And then when they put their attention on your true self, you feel that inspiration. You feel that deep love that they have for you, a love that you can't imagine how they could know that without having met you, without knowing anything about your mind or personality. How can you love me? You don't even know me. But indeed, they know the you that you don't even know. They know that initial light before it hits mind, before it comes through body. And they can tell the story of everything about you by looking at that. Nothing exists except the one. That one is the Supreme Brahman. So long as he keeps the I in us, he reveals to us that it is he who, as the primal energy, creates, preserves, and destroys the universe. That which is Brahman is also the primal energy. Once a king asked a yogi to impart knowledge to him in one word, the yogi said, all right, you will get knowledge in one word. After a while, a ma magician came to the king. The king saw the magician moving two of his fingers rapidly and heard him exclaim, behold, O king, behold. The king looked at him amazed when after a few, mi after a few minutes, he saw the two fingers becoming one. The magician moved that one finger rapidly and said, Behold, king, behold. The implication of this story is that Brahman and the primal energy are at, at first appear to be two. But after attaining the knowledge of Brahman, one does not see the two. Then there is no differentiation. It is one, one without a second, Advaita, non-duality. So that's the reality. And you can have this by simply stepping out of mind, which is breaking everything up for you, collecting things through the five gates of the senses and trying to create a symbol of oneness, but failing miserably. Step out of mind, step back, become that witness, untouched, not connected to anything witnessed by the words me and mine. And you'll find timelessness, you'll find freedom, you'll find contentment, you'll find fearlessness. These are of your nature. And right now we can only imagine them and posit them as possibilities. But with practice and the blessing of grace, we all will come to know. Any questions or comments? Checking online. <laughs> Yes. Remember last time you said at the beginning you were talking about how we kind of know about infinity, not from things that we see in the world, because nothing in the world is infinite. Isn't the sky infinite? Oh, well, the sky is round. <laughs> you know, what is the sky? How, how to define the sky? Like you keep going, right? You just go into space and you keep going. Not yeah. It seems like infinity. It's very, very large for us. Of course, we don't know at this point, but the scientists say that that space has a limit, that there is a boundary. I heard in uh, my science class that if you draw a straight line, an infinitely, seemingly infinite long straight line, you'll come back to the beginning because space curves. So, I mean, you know, in that sense, uh, we can, we, we, you can get an idea of very large, and for us, that's probably more really what we're thinking when we say infinite. We're thinking really large. But it's actually the way that you come to an understanding. Well, there's a couple of things. One, Vivekananda says that, that if you notice, everything in this created world goes in circles. You know, the, the atom, the electrons are around the nucleus, the planets around the sun, you know, the Earth around its axis. 
It's like everything goes in circles. And he says, why is that? And he says, because there's no other way to represent infinity in the finite than a circle. And so God, in order to manifest his infinity, had to make everything go in circles. So you have something with no beginnings and no ends in there. But to, to really know infinity, it, it's, it's a removal of all limit. You know, that, that, that there, there is no distinction in the same way that time, like in eternity doesn't mean a long time, it means no time, it means outside of time. And so infinity doesn't mean a long distance, it means the, the opposite of uh, relativity. You see, because in this world, you can't, you can't know the nature of anything without something else, right? So you can't say that's big if there wasn't something else that was small. So all of our knowledge is relational. And if you don't have an ultimate absolute, rel the relative does not exist. There's, there's no way that it can exist. And so that is God, that unchanging absolute, the original, the original one without a second, from which everything is measured. And he's put that image within you, and that's why you measure everything from yourself. You are actually that manifestation of that one absolute unchanging. And so we measure everything from self in a relative world, because in a relative world, no one thing has any inherent existence. It all depends on something else for all of its attributes. And you can see that it's fun to sit in the shrine sometime in our meditation, try and think of the one thing that you know that doesn't depend on anything else that you know. It's quite a lovely meditation, and it's beautiful where it takes you. I won't, I won't ruin the story, but think about it. Spend some time doing that and see where you end up. It's quite, quite a lovely walk. To sit and try and think of the one thing that you can know that's not dependent on anything else that you know. Do you have one thing? Do you have something you know that doesn't depend on anything else? And, Is that infinity? Uh, it's an investigation into it. Really, you end up with, with the I am. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's the only thing you know. And you only know that conceptually even because how do you... What, what does it mean to exist? What is existence? You know, it's funny if you if you take anything and think about it enough, <laughs> it it dissolves. <laughs> you realize there's no way to define those ultimates. You know that stand at the end of a chain of thinking. It's always they always dissolve. That's why Vivekananda says that the early rishis. That's why they turned around and went inward, is because they realized that behind every question that they answered, there were more questions, that the questions would multiply as you went out. And that no matter, he says, you could, Vivekananda says, you can pick up a grain of sand on the beach and you can study that grain of sand for your entire life. And he said that there will be an infinite number of lives still to come for you to study that one grain of sand. You will never know all there is to know about even a grain of sand. It becomes, it all, it all begins to fall apart. And we're finding that, especially like in, uh, the, what is that, quantum physics, which I only know enough about it to call it weird. But, uh, you know, it's that, it's that whole, there's no there there. The, that statement that uh, the universe doesn't take shape until there's an observer. You know, uh, I, I, in the New York Times wrote an article that I've mentioned before about, about quantum physics, and they're saying that the underlying reality is like this black goo where time runs forward and backwards simultaneously, and there is no form until it's observed. You give it form by being the observer, which is which is Vedanta 101. It's beautiful. You know, it's wonderful. But there's nothing, there is no there there. That's why, as a materialist, you can never go out and know. You're, you, you will always only know an infinitesimal amount in comparison to what there is to know. And so by turning around and going in, you go into the bottleneck. You know, all of that stuff is coming here. And so know the nature of here, 
and you'll know the nature, well, you'll know the non-existence of there. Very much like, I always think of a dream. A dream is kind of my comfort coat. I always think about dreams. Because in a dream, you can see all of this, but you know that it exists only in mind. Uh, and so you can, you can look at those mountains 200 miles away and know that they're still between your ears. There's not 200 miles there. And so you can see how all of this can so easily be an illusion. You can see how all of this uh, can, can be unreal. You can see reincarnation happen. You fall asleep, you take a new body, a new dream body, and you take it completely. It's no surprise to you. There's no adjustment at all. You move into that new body, you're perfectly comfortable. And you've left a whole life behind, laying in the bed. And you have no memory of it, no awareness of it. So there you are skipping around a dream world in a dream body in your own mind, unaware of things that at this moment you can't even imagine forgetting. And so a dream is a wonderful, a wonderful lesson, a wonderful way to see how all of this can actually, even seeming as, as strange and bizarre as the Vedanta does, these truths that these sages see, as odd as it is, you experience it every night. You know, so you can see that this, that this reality. There's a question on this one. Yes. Question online? Yeah. There's a misunderstanding. Could you explain why the practice of love is not enough to practice yoga in this age? How the practice of love is not, not enough? Well, no, that's not the practice of love. Practice of love is devotion. So that's bhakti, and that's the fastest and most effective path. We're talking about like the Gyanic practices, the Patanjali's practices, that for you to be able to be convinced that you're not a body and mind and to hold on to that thought, it's such a rarefied condition. You know, in the old days, they could wander off into the mountains and they could sit by themselves and the villagers would bring food. And, you know, it's like India, you can still do that in some places. But in the modern world, with the constant noise, the constant change, the, the, just the pressure to keep going, and with as few people as are even asking these questions, you know, these days, there's just no way to support that rarefied environment that it takes to successfully, in, in a lifetime, you know, churn out these results. Now, that's not to say you can't get there at all. It's just saying that that is a very difficult path. And Ramakrishna is not negating the other three yogas. He's just saying, for this age, if you want to get there the fastest that you can possibly get there, do it with devotion. Devotion in this age will get you faster than, any, than the other ones. It's not to say don't do them or you can't do them. He's just saying those are going to be really hard. You know, do, it, do this <laughs> instead. But bring them all in. You know, that was really what, what Ramakrishna, Vivekananda, Holy Mother were really about. Is that, that all the yogas, they're not really four separate yogas. It's a matter of emphasis. So you become, you practice devotion prominently, but then you talk about the dream world, you talk about one without a second, you think about what thought you have that doesn't depend on any other. These are all Gyanic practices, but they support your devotion, you know, in that it shows you the nature of the beloved that you're approaching, that builds your faith, that, that, that makes, it, makes you understand this is worthwhile, and it prevents you from procrastinating and from being lazy by lighting a little fire of interest underneath you. Like, hmm, I wonder. <laughs> like that. So I hope that answers his question. <laughs> the practice of love uh, is, oh, it's my fave, obviously. Well, I hope it's, <laughs> I say that as if it is obvious, but uh, yeah. So the practice of love is the fastest path. And uh, by yoga, he's meaning a very particular type of yoga, not, not just yoga in the general sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then the question just came. I'm not successful in, in a career. Am I not eligible for a spiritual path and spiritual growth? I am not getting confidence from my bench. Don't look for confidence from outside. Your confidence will never come because 
Yeah, you know, you, you, I remember back in the 90s, I, when, when was I telling this story? But the, back in the 90s, Bill Gates, right, the richest man in the world, and I remember reading that, and I was in computers, so that was a big deal. He had $120 billion at that point, peanuts compared to today, apparently. But anyway, he was there, and then the next day I read uh, uh, in the business section that uh, because overnight the markets had changed, Larry Ellison was now the richest person in the world. And I remember sitting there thinking, I bet that really bothers him. <laughs> you know, I bet if you're the richest man in the world, you wanted to be that. You know, you, you worked very hard to get there. And then something completely out of your control changes things so that now you're not the richest man in the world anymore. And number two is now number one. And that is the nature of everything in the relative world. It will not stand still long enough for you to find your stability in it or on it. You know, become rich, the fear of losing it will grow within you, you know. Grow rich so that you have leisure and the responsibility of the thousands that work for you will take away that leisure, that peace of mind. You cannot, by definition and by plan, find your stability and your happiness in this world. Mother does not want you stuck here. She doesn't want you to whirl around this forever, you know. That's why in the Garden of Eden, that second tree, the tree of immortality, there's two trees in the garden, right? There's the tree of immortality and there's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And when, when uh, Adam and Eve are thrown out of the garden, really thrown out of their knowledge of self, into this world of the senses because that's what the ego that's what the ego is based on you know and that's what the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil is it's your senses it's it's reaching out seeing something beautiful seeing that it's good for food and then thinking it will give you wisdom you go outside of yourself and you get thrown out of the garden you get thrown out of your inner peace you can't find your way back you have to then he says till at the dust of the earth for all the days of your life you're going to be out there working constantly to fulfill your desires, right? And how many people are out there working 60, 70 hours for what? To pay for vacations, to pay for cars, to pay for wives and husbands and houses and kill kids and education. And that's, that's the curse of going out through the senses. There is no rest there. There is no end there. But to get back in to the garden and have access to the tree of immortality, which is still there, God did what? He put up a cherubim with the flaming sword of desire to protect the garden. So until you reach the state of desirelessness, which is your absolute surrender to your nature, you can't get back to that inner peace, to that garden of unity, to that garden of harmony, where you will find the tree of immortality. You know, where you will find that you never were this body, this mind. You've never been born. You've never died. You are and have always been and will always be, not for a very long time, but in this eternal moment, this moment right here, right now, that doesn't begin and doesn't end. It always is. You know, and that, that is eternity, to be present fully in the moment. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly it. I mean, you have it available to you, but it's in the space of no thought, you know, the space of no thing, nothing, you know, which we're trained to because we because we've trained ourselves to identify with the material. We think that nothing is empty. There's nothing there, but it's the emptiness that gives rise to everything. You know, it's the it's the no thing that contains everything and the silence that contains all vibration, all sound, all possibilities. So you are that infinite potential for everything, for all things. And again, you can see it in your dreams. Look at the amazing things you do in your dreams that you conjure up in real time at night while you sleep. Whole worlds of existence. <laughs> Armies and oceans and mountains and cities. It's an amazing... It's an amazing journey. All right. 
I'm going to read this last little song here about Mother for closing. Awake, Mother, awake. How long you have been asleep in the lotus of the Mulatara. Fulfill your secret function, Mother. Rise to the thousand-petaled lotus within the head where the mighty Shiva has his dwelling. Swiftly pierce the six lotuses and take away my grief, O essence of consciousness. Jai Ma, Jai Thakur, Jai Swamiji. <laughs>